Welcome to this week's Being Human. I'm delighted to say my guest is Dan Ward. Dan is a multiple author and uh, we'll get into the content of those books as we go through the conversation. He was recommended to me by a regular listener. So Dan, welcome to the show. Well, good morning, Richard. It's delightful to be here. So excited to be part of this, uh, this conversation. Great. So, so let's start. You're a military man by by training, uh, and then we'll we'll get we'll obviously we'll, we'll get into your to your work and your ideas around your know, product development and, and and so on. Um, but yeah, f- fill us in a little bit on your on your background. Sure. Uh, so my undergraduate degree is electrical engineering. Uh, my most recent master's is in systems engineering. I have another master's in engineering management uh, mixed in there somewhere. Uh, but I spent 20 years on active duty in the United States Air Force. Uh, so as a military technologist, uh, engineer, and program manager, uh, my job was to help shepherd the development of advanced new uh, military technology systems. So I did uh, like bench-level uh, laser research, which was way less exciting than it sounds. Uh, I've been part of the intelligence community, working on like big IT systems, uh, a lot of cybersecurity work. Uh, I served at the Pentagon. I was in Afghanistan. Uh, I had a chance to testify before the Senate Armed Services Committee uh, for the U.S. Senate uh, and also the, the British uh, House of Commons. Uh, I had a chance to testify to the Parliament uh, twice. So, um, oh. yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, along the way, I wrote a couple books, uh, like you mentioned, and uh, spent a little bit of time as an independent author, speaker, and consultant uh, before landing in my current position uh, with a company called the MITRE Corporation. We're a system engineering, uh, a federally funded research and development corporation, so we're a nonprofit uh, company that helps provide... Uh, system engineering expertise and, and guidance to federal agencies. Great. Okay. Um, I, so there was a few nuggets in there, which was just caught, caught my interest, you know, just, just to, to fill in the picture a little bit more. So you served in Afghanistan. Tell us, tell us more. I, I did. I did. I spent uh, about six months in uh, Kabul uh, at the International Security Assistance Headquarters, uh, so ISAF headquarters. Um, my job had nothing to do with technology. It was one of those weird um, assignments where, you know, it was more of the military training and less of the technology training. Uh, I ran the Joint Visitors Bureau. So basically, we were a, a travel agency with body armor and weapons. Uh, our job was to take care of uh, transportation, security, and building for VIPs coming into theater. And I learned a new term while I was over there, VVIPs, so very, very important people. That's a whole other category of, <laughs> of important person coming into, uh, into that area. And uh, I had a brilliant opportunity to serve with... Uh, People from all around the world, I had, uh, officers from five different countries serving underneath me, uh, and a French general, a German general, an Italian general serving uh, above me. Uh, it, was, it was quite an experience. And, and what was the stickiest moment in, in all of that? Oh, uh, <laughs> first, I didn't have too many sticky moments. Uh, I do remember one day standing uh, outside in the rain, of course, uh, because all good military stories begin with it was raining. And uh, I'm standing outside the gate with my checklist, uh, check uh, a clipboard as vehicles are driving up and I'm coming up to the window and saying, are you on this checklist? Can you, you know, find your name here to let them in? Uh, it was, uh, it was a, a surreal moment to just be having these random cars driving up to me and, and I'm, I'm hoping they're all nice people. Uh, and they were, <laughs> and it, it all worked out just fine. Right, right. And, and, the, and the Senate committee, so what, what, what was that about? You, Tell us about testifying. Sure. So the uh, Senate Armed Services Committee, uh, Senator John McCain, uh, it was his office that invited me to come and, and testify on military technology development. Uh, specifically, my, my testimony was uh, basically that constraints work, that uh, the best results tend to come from small teams with short schedules and tight budgets. And so I uh, drew from, from some, some research I had done and some of my own personal stories of leading military technology teams uh, that were ahead of schedule under budget and uh, performed you know more than they were designed to do right um we, yeah well, well maybe that's the that's the segue into into the, into your body of work um um so you started with this idea with, with the with the title fist i did i did so <laughs> i remember as a as a fairly junior captain sitting at my desk uh and trying to figure out like why do so many military technology systems and, and technology systems in general, but particularly in the military, uh, why do they cost more, take longer, and do less than promised? And at the same time, I knew there was this smaller collection of projects and programs out there that delivered ahead of schedule and under budget and did more than they were designed to do. And I I wanted to understand, well, what's the difference and how do I get more into that second category and out of that first category? 
And so as I began doing some research, just very uh, independently on my own for uh, initially and then more formally uh, later for my second master's, uh, my, my master's degree thesis was, was on this topic. Um, I began to notice a pattern that when I was, my biggest frustrations and failures were inevitably when I had a cast of thousands and we were spending decades and billions. All my biggest successes were when I had no time, no money, no people, just a really important mission and we just had to go get it done. Uh, so I coined this, this acronym FIST, uh, which stood for fast, inexpensive, simple, and tiny. Uh, and the basic premise of FIST was that constraints work, constraints foster creativity, uh, and that having less time, less money, uh, smaller teams tends to deliver better products. Uh, when I retired from the Air Force and, and went to write my book, we rebranded FIST to be fire. Uh, <laughs> wisely, I think. <laughs> I think that was a wise move. So fire stands for fast, inexpensive, restrained, and elegant. Uh, and part of the idea with the FIST idea was that like the FIST is the simplest cheapest weapon anybody could make. Okay. Uh, right. And so transitioning from fist to fire, now instead of talking about weapons, we're talking about tools. Uh, would that every sword could be turned into a plowshare? You know, and that's part of the, the idea as well with, uh, with the rebranding. Right. And, and it was this fist idea that you presented to the Senate, or was this later? Um, yes, yes. I think we hadn't quite, uh, the book hadn't quite come out yet. I was still on active duty uh, for when I spoke with the Senate and the House of Commons both. Uh, and so those were still using the FIST terminology. Same basic concept, just new acronym. Right. And how, and how did that go down? I mean, what, what, what was the reception to this? Uh, it, was, it was intimidating to walk into that room and to see Senator McCain and a number of these other senators who I'd only ever seen on TV before. And they're sitting up on this big platform and they're asking us questions. Uh, I obviously prepared my opening uh, remarks. And so I had some notes to go on and that, that helped a lot. Uh, the biggest gut check moment was when one of the senators turned to the other three people on the panel there that, that day and said, Dan said some interesting things. Do you all agree with him? And I went, oh, I could leave the room if you need me to step out. Uh, but fortunately, uh, the other three uh, were, all, were all very kind and said, oh, no, yeah, we, we agree Dan's, uh, Dan's on track. So. Right. And do you think, I mean, we'll definitely get more into the, the, the nuts and bolts of, of these ideas, but do you think there has been any kind of a shift in, in the way government take on initiatives? Have, have they taken things and made them you know, faster and less expensive and simpler and more tiny? I mean, has, do you detect a trend or not? Uh, I, I do. I do. I've kind of felt like we've been just on the cusp of a major shift for probably a decade and a half. <laughs> But I, I genuinely do see significant movement uh, in that direction these days, more than, than ever before. Uh, I mean, this kind of thought process, this approach to design, this approach to technology has been around forever. It's been around for a really long time. As far back as World War II, you find examples of you know, military technology being developed on a shoestring with a cannonball schedule uh, with, with, with really small teams. I think we're doing more of, of that kind of thing these days than we have in the past. But uh, I mean, like the Agile Manifesto was, uh, was it 1999, 2001? So it's like 20 years old. Uh, so, so these concepts are not entirely new. They're not like we've never done it this way before. Uh, we've done it this way quite a lot. And a lot of, big part of my work is telling these stories, letting people know, hey, here's an instance when we did it. Here are the imitable practices that we can apply to our next project. Uh, and, and yes, I, I am very uh, satisfied to see that, that we're seeing more of that type of thinking more of that design approach, more of that practice being uh, applied to projects and programs these days. Right. So tell us a few of the stories, so your successes, um, fisting, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so the opening story in my first book, Fire, uh, is about the Condor Cluster. So the Condor Cluster was uh, a, um, a supercomputer that was uh, activated in December of 2010. And when they cut the ribbon in December 2010, this was the fastest supercomputer in the Department of Defense's entire inventory. Uh, the Pentagon has access to some pretty high-speed machines. This one outperformed them all. And, and that's a really important point because this is best-in-class, world-class capability. Uh, the reason I like this story, it was developed for one-tenth the cost of a comparable supercomputer. Uh, but the really cool thing about it is how they developed this thing. I was at the Air Force Research Lab in, in Rome, New York, tiny little postage stamp of a place. Uh, I was stationed there a couple of years back and, and just had a, a wonderful time there. But they built it out of 1,760 PlayStation 3s. 
not even the most recent version of the PlayStation 3s. This was the previous year's model that they were able to buy a bunch of them at a discount. Uh, <laughs> the part of the message here is that it is possible to develop and deliver world-class capabilities on a shoestring for, for one-tenth of the, the budget. But the reason they did that is because they didn't have a big budget to begin with. If, if that office had had 10 times as much money, what would they have done? They, they would have gone down to Supercomputers R Us. They would have bought a standard supercomputer. They would have paid 10 times as much, and it would not have been any faster. Uh, so this, again, this idea that constraints foster creativity because they didn't have a lot of people, they didn't have a lot of time, they didn't have a lot of money, they were forced to get creative. And in that forcing function and being forced to get creative, they didn't sacrifice capability, they didn't sacrifice value. Uh, they delivered, again, a, a best-in-class supercomputer that was faster than every other supercomputer in the Pentagon's entire inventory. It's an amazing story. I, I wish I'd been part of that team. I can't claim any credit for that one. Uh, but uh, it's, I think it's a really important example of what can happen uh, when, we, when we take this sort of approach. And, and, and so, that, so you're really emphasizing the R there of fire, right? The, the restraint, you're seeing that as being... Absolutely. I think restraint is kind of the common theme that runs through the other, uh, the other pieces. So speed, thrift, and simplicity are the three touch phrases I use a lot. So the three attributes we look for. So speed is just restraint in time. Thrift is restraint in money. Simplicity is restraint in complexity. So really, it's just a single word, restraint, and then I sort of get unrestrained, and I use three words for it, so speed, thrift, and simplicity. Right. And it reminds me a little bit of, um, of Kaizen in the lean philosophy. Um, and, I, and I read a book on that recently. Um, and uh, a particular guru, guru was, one of his, his, his rules were, if you want to improve the efficiency of your production line, um, then you're not allowed to use computers. You're, you're only allowed to move the, mat the material at hand. So that, that took it to a real extreme, like super constrained. Basically, you're not allowed to spend anything. Um, sure. Just with what you've got available, improve uh, the efficiency of, or the quality of what you're dealing with. And so you're really taking that and putting it centrally to, to your approach. Yeah, yeah, I think that approach is, is so relevant in such a broad range of uh, disciplines and categories and, and domains. Uh, you know, in, in, in India, you see this uh, Jugad, uh, J-U-G-G-A-D, or maybe it's two Gs or two As, I, I can't spell it, uh, but this idea of thrifty innovation, of using existing materials, existing resources uh, to produce something that's really, you know, solves significant problems and delivers real value. But yeah, I definitely have a lot of background in, in lean, in agile. I've, I've had a lot of that training, a lot of those certifications. Uh, I'm not a purist of, of any of them certainly not a, an agile purist or a lean purist. What I try to do is find the, uh, the useful pieces of, of each of these practices and kind of amalgamate them together into you know, the, the things that are most relevant and, and applicable to the work that I do. Right. Um, and the other story I love from, uh, I think it was far as well, was the, the British example of the, the, the health and safety information system. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I love that one. Uh, <laughs> it was the strangest experience. Two times as I was in the middle of writing this book, I get emails out of the blue from random people I've never met before saying, hey Dan, I've read some of your other articles. Could I tell you my story? And maybe you'll write an article about this. And I was like, actually, I'm in the middle of writing a book. Could I give you a chapter in my book? Uh, that didn't happen before or since, but just the universe sort of smiled on me and I got these two brilliant stories. Uh, from from people who had firsthand experience on, on doing this kind of stuff. So the health and safety information system uh, was basically an online PDF library, uh, the, the sexiest type of technology in the world, uh, an online PDF library, right? Uh, no, it's, it's nothing particularly exciting, but what is exciting is that they, uh, he built it, if I recall, for I think 1% of the cost of the competitors. And so what happened was pounds versus seven million pounds, right? Yes, Probably. yes, thank you. Uh, <laughs> the um, the British government, had, or the British MOD, had put out a, a request for proposals to build this new system, and uh, the gentleman who won had no idea that his bid was literally one percent of what the other bidders had proposed. Uh, and good on the MOD for for picking that one. I mean, typically when we see such disparity in the bids. The default position is, oh, that, that, low, that low number, that person must not understand the problem. That person must not know what they're doing. But fortunately, the, the proposal was written well enough, and, and the MOD had the imagination to say, oh, you know what? The people who, build, who bid 100 times as much, they're the ones who don't understand the problem. They're the ones who don't really know what they're doing. So they went with the, the lower bid. 
Um, and if that had not worked out well, like if he had not been able to deliver on that one, they would have been out at 65,000 pounds. You know, they still would have had plenty of time and money to recover and, and try again. That's an important part of the story. Uh, but what he delivered um, was hugely successful. It was, I think, 10 times better than what they had before. It saved a bunch of manpower and it continues to be one of the most um, uh, visited sites on the MOD's uh, intra in, intranet, if, if I recall. So yeah. it, it, it was, it was, I was so excited to get that story from Alan. Right. And you, you touch a little bit there on this idea of it's, it's okay to fail, which is, I guess in some sense has become almost a little bit of a cliche in sort of agile <laughs> circles now, but um, the, you, you bring in Nicholas Taleb's work on anti-fragility and, and the relevance mm. there. Could, could you expand on that a bit? Yeah, he's a, he's a fascinating writer, uh, and he, he coined this term anti-fragile to basically convey the idea that on the one end of the spectrum, you have things that are fragile, things that break when they are exposed to stresses. Uh, and as you move a little further along this, uh, this spectrum, you get to things that are robust, things that do not break when they are exposed to, uh, to stresses. So you have the teacup, which is fragile. You have your rubber mallet, which you can bang the rubber mallet as much as you, as, as you want to. And it is still a good rubber mallet. It is no longer, you know, hasn't broken in, in response to these stresses. But then he says, if you keep going along the spectrum, we don't have a word for things that improve when they are exposed to stresses, this anti-fragile concept. Uh, but we do have an experience of things that improve when they're subjected to stress, like our bodies. You, know, you go to the gym, you lift weights, you're exposing your muscles to stress. You go out for a long run, you're exposing your legs and your cardiovascular system to stress. Those things get better. They get stronger uh, in response to that to those stressors. And he says, so what we're going to do is build teams and organizations that are anti-fragile because we can't reduce all stress. We can't reduce all you know um, forces on on us that, that would otherwise cause harm. Uh, and that there are ways to make our teams, our programs, our designs anti-fragile. That that they get better when they're exposed to, to stress and challenges. And and this example with the MOD was. Right, we can throw sixty-five thousand, but but we can we can learn quickly, right? Even if right. It doesn't work out, we we we've, we've set ourselves up. Yeah, well, and you use a really important word there. We can learn. We can learn quickly. Uh, I like to say you know, when we talk about failure, learning is not failure. Uh, learning is not failure. If we're if we're learning, that's got to count as a step in the right direction, not as a as a backward step. Uh, and I think that's one of the keys to anti fragility is if we are. You know, we can frame things as failing or we can frame them as learning opportunities and be able to apply that validated learning to our next step, to our next project, to our next uh, endeavor. All right. Okay. So, I'm, so if we take fire, we, so we talk about um, fast, inexpensive, which is about restraint and then res restraint as a sort of organizing idea here, but then elegant. So mm. how do you or achieve elegance in, in product development? Yeah, so elegance uh, was sort of the new word for simplicity. And I, and I actually like elegance better than simplicity because simplicity is one of those words that, that has a lot of baggage with it. Some people will use the word simple and what they mean is easy. Some people use the word simple, what they mean is not complicated. Uh, and those are two different things because um, uh, sometimes something can be simple but hard. Uh, and it is possible for something to be simple and difficult. Uh, and we also have this word simplistic. Uh, simplistic tends to have a negative connotation. Uh, and every once in a while I give a talk and somebody will say, oh, Dan, I, I loved your message. It was so simplistic. I'm like, oh, no, don't tell me my message was simplistic. Hopefully it was simple uh, in, in a good way. Uh, and the difference I like to draw, draw is uh, simple versus simplistic is the same as childlike versus childish. You know, it's good to be childlike, to have that childlike sense of awe and wonder of the world, to be childish. Uh, is, is not a good thing. <laughs> um, so because these words have, have so much baggage with them and there's a lot of ambiguity about what we mean by them, I think elegance is a, is a better word. And so mathematicians will talk about an elegant proof uh, or a beautiful proof, one that is streamlined, simplified as the fewest number of steps to get to the, the final result. Um, you find elegant theorems in, in physics, uh, again, that, that are not excessively complicated, that are, are really just the, the essentials uh, and that's what we aim for in our design. So when I, when I autograph copies of my, my Simplicity Cycle book, I often write, uh, may all your designs be elegant. Uh, that's kind of my, my tagline for those books. Right. Um, an example you look in the book, and maybe I can just, I can just share it now, because I was, um, 
I was in awe of of the beauty of, of the of the the meow bridge, right? Um, oh yes, viaduct, should I say? Um, right. So for those of, who are watching, or for those listening, what I'm now oh, doing is bringing up a picture of this viaduct. So tell us a bit about the story of this viaduct. Well, ah, I think is absolutely the right word. Uh, I was watching a, a movie where there was a scene where the main character is driving across this bridge and I literally paused the movie and jumped on Google to figure out what is this bridge? It was so breathtaking. Uh, the movie was Mr. Bean's Holiday, a uh, super funny movie, I'm a big fan of Mr. Bean. Um, but the, the bridge is called the Meow Viaduct and not only is it just stunning, I mean, it completely stole the scene. But it turns out it was delivered ahead of schedule and under budget, which is not typical for these big mega projects, these big civil engineering mega projects. And with the, the builders, the designers of the Meow Viaduct just did everything right. Uh, the way they approached design, the way they approached construction. Um, and not only did they save time, not only was it built faster, it had a smaller ecological footprint, a smaller uh, impact on the environment where they were operating. And it's just this amazing success story that I think a lot of people uh, would benefit from hearing. Um, back to Talib, uh, one of the lines that I, I sort of paraphrased from his book, uh, he says that the status quo appears inevitable when viable alternatives are not readily visible. So let me say that again. The status quo appears inevitable when viable alternatives are not readily visible. So a lot of my work is telling these stories of these viable alternatives. That innovation doesn't have to cost so much, take so long, and be so complicated. Bridges don't have to be over budget and, and over schedule. That it is possible to deliver world class, best in class, first in class, advanced new technologies, and things like massive bridges. It's possible to do that ahead of schedule and under budget with a smaller impact on the environment, better value for the users. Uh, and this is true whether we're talking about spacecraft, aircraft, IT systems. Um, radar systems or, uh, or, or bridges, uh, you know, and so telling these stories it really points to two things, points to imitable principles and practices. And, and that's what the, the fire book is mostly full of stories that point to principles and practices that we can use in, in other domains and other situations uh, to get yeah. better results faster. And one of the things they did in terms of restraining themselves, right, they, they use steel, not concrete. And you see right. this beautiful steel concrete, this steel structure, which, um, yeah, which which is elegant uh, and, and and much much cheaper, right, than the alternative. Absolutely cheaper, more robust, easier to build, easier to maintain, um, uh, easier to sort of yeah, do the upkeep on, um, and they built it faster. So they're all it's like every good thing you could possibly have hoped for in a civil engineering project that all happened there. And it almost sounds too good to be true. And the more I read read about it, the more I you know read case studies and, and interviews with people who were involved in the project. I was just like, this is like the perfect project. How have I never heard about this until I watched Mr. Bean's movie? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so the lesson there, kids, is watch Mr. Bean. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, but you also point out in the book, it was a 10-year design phase. Um, correct, correct. So, and we're used to, especially this is my experience of what certainly helps often in the context of software development is to curtail that design. It's a time box as much as possible, that, that, that design phase, um, because there's always a risk of people over-engineering the, the, the design and getting into too much detail and too much, um, mm -hmm. um, too much time spent trying to second guess what the users are gonna need before something's put in front of them. Um, so I know that this is a this is a physical project, not a software one. What do you sort of take from that? Do you where, where do you draw the line in terms of upfront planning and design when it comes to to non physical projects? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and one of the things I love about this example is yes, they spent ten years on the design. In an absolute sense, ten years seemed like a long time to spend designing something. Absolutely. But the the lesson I draw from that is that there is no specific unit of time that is perfect for every category, every genre of technology. So this bridge is going to last for 100 years. So we have spent one-tenth of its lifetime doing the design work. So imagine if, you're, if your software was going to last for, uh, let's say, one year, 
you know, you're only going to have the software is only going to be in existence for one year. Uh, then maybe you would spend uh, a little public math here, 1.2 months uh, on you know, doing some initial prep and some thought. Uh, and then that 10 year design and work involved like physically surveying the landscape. Uh, anytime you build a bridge, this is a unique solution uh, that this bridge will never be built again. You can have similar bridges, but because of the hills and valleys and, and the way the uh, landscape and the air and the wind, all these things come together, that is genuinely a unique solution. Uh, and so therefore it requires a little bit of additional advanced planning. Um, so again, we wanna make sure uh, we spend as little time as possible in this design phase, so we immediately get into building stuff, experimenting, trying things, iterating. Uh, with a bridge, you don't do a lot of iterations, right? Uh, but we can do iterations for pieces of it. We can do iterations for some of the manufacturing uh, methods and the assembly methods. Um, so I want to spend as little time as possible, but it is also possible that 10 years was the fastest possible uh, design uh, phase that you would, could have possibly had for that, uh, for that type of, of system. Uh, another example I use a lot is the Virginia class submarine uh, program for the United States Navy. Now, the Virginia class sub costs $2 billion a piece. It would be crazy for me to say that's a cheap submarine. Um, $2 billion is a lot of money in, in any scale. Uh, however, the Virginia class submarine um, was the replacement for a previous submarine called the, the Seawolf sub. Uh, the Seawolf cost $4.4 billion a piece. The Seawolf was so far behind schedule, so far over budget, and, and had so many problems that the program was terminated. The Navy was going to buy 29 of them, and they ended up with three and said, hey, we, we can't do that anymore. So having spent $4.4 billion a piece, the next one only cost $2 billion, so less than half of the price of its predecessor. So in that particular genre, in that category of technology, I do contend that the Virginia class submarine is the cheapest, cutest, smallest, fastest little nuclear-powered submarine you're ever going to find. Uh, again, in an absolute sense, $2 billion is a lot of money, but in that category, uh, less than half the cost of its predecessor. I'm going to go ahead and call that uh, thrifty. Right, right. <laughs> um, yeah. So what emerges from me there in that conversation is, uh, speaking about the design element of this, is maybe a useful question to ask is, how long are we planning to spend on design versus our expectation of the overall lifetime of this piece of technology? Like, that's a, a good question to ask. Yeah, yeah, and I think those of us in the software world, and that's kind of my, my background as well, we oftentimes, you know, we kind of have our own confirmation biases and our, our experiential biases where we tend to think that, you know, gosh, I, sh I should you know, be coding right away, we should be fielding right away, that continuous delivery, uh, and we look at something else like, oh, you spent 10 years planning something? Oh, you're, you're clearly, that was, that was wrong. Um, well, no, for hardware, for a bridge, like that, that might be the fastest <laughs> That's the yeah. least amount of time you might want to spend on that. So getting out of our own way, uh, challenging our own biases and recognizing that, you know, the general rules of, of speed are going to apply in different categories, but what speed looks like in different categories might be a little bit different. Right. Right. Um, I, now, I wonder if now is a good time to move on to what you introduce in fire and then expand on in, uh, in the simplicity cycle. And that's this, um, this this matrix of thinking about goodness and and complexity, and I wondered if my my, my now might be a good time to just sure. to just throw up that graphic again for people who are watching, uh, and for people who are listening, we're just we're throwing up a matrix here with with goodness on one axis and, and complexity on the other, goodness on the on the x axis and complexity on the y axis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the uh, the simplicity cycle. Um, shows up, it appears in the in the firebook. Uh, and of the three themes throughout the firebook, speed, thrift, and simplicity, I felt like simplicity was the one that really needed the deep dive, uh, the, the closer examination of, of what is simplicity, uh, what is complexity, how do we make good decisions about complexity, and then how do we make good decisions under conditions of complexity. Uh, and so because these words have so much baggage with them, I wanted to provide readers with a visual vocabulary to almost a kinetic vocabulary to help us have these conversations with our teams, with our stakeholders, with our, our supervisors, or our colleagues uh, about how do we, uh, and the, the, the uh, subtitle for the book is uh, a field guide to making things better without making them worse. So how do we make things better without making them worse? <laughs> uh, because so often I'm an engineer, uh, as engineers, we like to solve problems by adding things. Uh, we solve problems by increasing the complexity of our design. And I demonstrate that I've contributed to the design. 
by adding things to the design. So that's what's happening from R1 to R2, from region one to region two. Uh, complexity is rising and goodness is rising. I'm so and then just for people listening, so that's, there's, a, there's a line going up and as you move sort of diagonally upwards, you're increasing complexity and you're also increasing goodness. Correct. Um, so you need to add things to make things better. Nothing isn't good, but some something something that's more complex than nothing, um, it has the potential of increasing goodness. Yeah, so like if you have a blank sheet of paper, um, that's going to be in the lower left corner of this quadrant. So complexity is low. There's nothing on the paper. And goodness is low. The paper doesn't say anything. So if I put ink on the paper, I do some words or some drawings or some sketches. Now the complexity of that paper has gone up. It now contains more pieces and parts and the goodness has also gone up. Now it conveys a message, it shows a picture. Uh, so we're moving up and to the right. And, and that kind of language is, is, is an important way to use the, sort of the use case for the simplicity cycle. We say we're moving up and to the right. Uh, I'm not saying it's getting more complicated or simpler or simplistic or any of those words, up and to the right. And we can visually see that. Uh, but we can't keep going up and to the right indefinitely where we have super high levels of complexity and optimal levels of goodness. At some point we hit this critical mass of complexity where any additional pieces or parts or functions are now going to move us up and to the left. So complexity continues to rise, but now we're moving to the left and goodness is now getting less. We, we've, this isn't just uh, uh, diminishing returns, this is negative returns. And this is where I added something, it got better, I added something, it got better, I added something, and now it got worse. And we've all seen that in, in designs uh, that we've produced ourselves uh, or that we've encountered that other people, I'm sure other people do this more than any of us, but. Um, you know, we're, we're like, gosh, that is more complicated than it is good. Uh, it's just hard, hard to use. It's confusing. I don't even know where to begin. Uh, and so when we hit that critical mass of complexity in the center of this chart, uh, the design move, the optimal next step is now to move down and to the right. We want to reduce complexity as a way to improve things. So picture your XY graph, you're moving down and to the right. Uh, and that's where we simplify, we streamline, we trim, we make things more elegant. We're subtracting as a way to improve. Uh, so creation by subtraction is a term I use a lot. And this is what a sculptor does. You take a large block of material and you chisel away the, the pieces of it that, uh, so that the final product weighs less, but it means more. It, it represents some, an image or a, a symbol of some kind. And ultimately you end up in the lower right-hand corner where complexity is as low as possible and goodness is as high as possible. And that's where we find these elegant solutions, these simple streamlined, you know, optimal goodness and low levels of, of complexity. So I want to end up down in the lower right hand side. Right. And then the, and the cycle element of this, explain that. Oh, yes. So <laughs> I say we want to end up in the lower right hand corner. Uh, the trick is we can't stay there. Uh, time exerts constant pressure in the direction of decreased goodness. So there's this arrow of time that is always pushing us to the left. So goodness is decreasing, where today's breakthrough becomes tomorrow's commodity. And that's because the environment where it's constantly changing. There's, there's new threats, there's new challenges, there's new opportunities, new technologies, new competitors. All these changes conspire to make that, you know, the thing that we developed gets less good over time because it's competing in a different, um, different ecosystem than the ecosystem that it was first sort of launched into. And um, because that slides us back into the left, uh, just straight to left, doesn't get more complicated, just gets less good. As we slide to the left, we need to begin the cycle over again. We're, now we begin to move up and to the right. We're adding new things, increasing complexity as a way to improve it, hit that critical mass in the middle. Now we want to move down and to the right, and then we get slid over to the left again, and the, and the cycle continues. Right. Yeah. And that explains why we, we, we need to be into this continuous pattern of, of innovation and, and continuous improvement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that, that, makes, that makes sense. Yeah. And, and the way I've described it is all very kind of, streamlined and straight lines and, and the truth is uh, we typically do not follow straight lines like it's, it's wobbly and wibbly and you loop around and, and that's okay that's all part of the process of exploration as long as your general trajectory is to the right and to, in the direction of increasing goodness uh, and that's really the main point of the whole book uh, I, <laughs> the, the most important line in the simplicity cycle book is that simplicity is not the point uh, goodness is the point we're trying to make things better uh, we're not trying to just make them simpler for the sake of simplicity. We're trying to improve them. And uh, it always drives me crazy when I, I give a simplicity cycle talk and people come up to me afterwards and say, boy, Dan, that was a great talk. I love how you just told us to keep it simple. I'm like, ah, that's exactly what I didn't say. <laughs> you know, right. we, we must allow complexity to rise. We, we have to make things more complicated first 
and then we can simplify them later. Uh, and so now in my talks, I always try to make that point uh, explicitly. And people still come up to me afterwards and say, hey, thanks for telling us to just keep it simple. But I think they fell asleep halfway through the middle or something. <laughs> <laughs> but if I just take an example of a specific product, I mean, an iPhone comes to mind, I guess. The, the, sure. I, I get to a point, right, where I've, I've, I've put as much complexity as I, as I can in order to achieve goodness, but the, the ecosystem has changed. Um, but there must become a point where I, I can't run this cycle again. I can't just add more stuff to the iPhone and, and keep up with everybody else. I, I presume I've got to invent something else and start again. So, so does this exhaust itself, this cycle at some point, or how, how do you account for that? Um, I, I think it generally does from a, from a product perspective. Uh, so Clayton Christensen talks about you know, the concept of disruptive innovation. And so when we have these, these new disruptive innovations that come in, oftentimes they are less good, less capable than the thing that they will eventually disrupt uh, because they've, they've shifted off into a different dimension. We're, we're measuring goodness in a different dimension. And I think that's where this cycle really does continue indefinitely, doesn't get completely exhausted. Any individual product might get exhausted. But what's happening there is we're defining goodness in different ways. Uh, and, and that's really sort of the secret of the whole book is the book is about helping people define what do we mean by goodness? Uh, right. What is the value we're providing? What are the measures of merit? What's the, um, the, the thing that people like about this, this product? Uh, at some point, we will reach you know, maximum iPod where there is no next level of, of goodness to be injected into the iPod. And we will have something else. And, and that something else may come from Apple or may come from somewhere else. Uh, but uh, again, understanding what goodness is, uh, means in that, uh, in that category, in that genre, in that technology, or for that product, that's really what the, what the book aims to help uh, designers and, and, and consumers uh, figure out. Now, the other interesting idea you, you introduce is this of the, the special piece. Can you expand on that? Yeah, um, so, uh, so the Simplicity Cycle is a design book, ultimately, and, and it's about the process of design. And when we talk about the, the, the special piece, there are certain moments in the design of a product or the design of, of code or, or you know, whatever we're making or even a process where we, we've been wrestling with it, we've been sort of swirling around, and then like sort of that magic happens. We introduce some special piece that just unlocks whole new dimensions of goodness uh, or a special piece by adding this one thing means I can take out 10 other things that, that are, are no longer necessary because this one new special piece uh, has showed up. And, you know, we, we, can't, all, we can't often do that on, on purpose. We can't, it's not always predictable. You know, we, you don't always know in advance, hey, I added this thing because I knew it was going to be the special piece. We kind of have to explore. We need to lean into it and experiment with it. And then sort of in retrospect, we're like, oh, Adding that thing, that was the, the magic moment where, where things really jump forward in a, in a significant way. Yeah, and you talk about, and what I like about that idea is that you talk about, so you might, incre you might be continuing to increase complexity and actually moving and reducing your goodness. So mm -hmm. you might actually be, be failing at some level, but you hit some special piece that then allows you to ultimately decrease complexity and move along the goodness. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, so design is, is an iterative process. It's an experimental process and it's a messy process. If, if we do it right, you know, the idea of um, trying to control it all and, and predict the impact of, of every single step along the way, uh, well, that, that's just not a very viable approach to design. You know, we need to, uh, as Amy Whitaker said in her book, Art Thinking, um, which is a terrific book. You should definitely get her on your show. Uh, art, but, uh, art thinking, sorry. Art thinking. Yeah, she was one of the first people to get an MFA and an MBA like simultaneously. I think you see more people doing that these days, but she was among the first to do that. Uh, and she says we should give ourselves permission to be more curious than absolutely correct. Uh, and I, just, I love that concept. Give yourself permission to be more curious than absolutely correct. Uh, because we're, we're here to learn. We're here to experiment and try stuff and get validated learning so we know what really does work. Uh, and not just guesses, not just hypotheses, but stuff based on actual data right that's my engineering roots showing through so <laughs> yeah yeah no no yeah I get, I get that so it's uh and, and that and that in, that enforces your point about it's not about making it simple right right it's about making it better right <laughs> but it might be making it more complicated um uh to begin with uh yeah mm -hmm. uh and I, I had this dark thought when i read that passage and i thought well is our our sort of brain machine interfaces for ai with human mm -hmm. beings actually the special piece 
that will ultimately <laughs> allow the grand designer in the sky to get to the human race, right? We're, you know, Elon talks about us bootstrapping, right? Some some higher level intelligence. Uh, it, it did it did have me wonder is, is is what yeah Musk is developing now with Neuralink and the, the brain yeah. AI interface is is that the <laughs> special piece? It, it, that's for all questions like that do make me want to go off and live in the woods. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that is scary, <laughs> but it could be. Who who knows? <laughs> right, right, yeah. Um, so I mean, you talk a little bit as well on uh, in the book about um some of the sort of the human factors in this as a design paradigm. So, mm-hmm. what have you sort of learned along the way? And I know, I know you reference various things in the books in terms of. The, the, the conditions or the environment uh, at, at a human allow, allow human level that allows for this this type of this mode of operation in, in developing products. Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think um, at the heart of a lot of the things I write about is trying to keep things to a human scale, uh, a human scale of understanding, a human scale of like the lifetime of a of a project. You know, when we spend twenty years on a project, or I should say. And nobody's been, or very few people spend 20 years on a project, uh, especially these days. But when a project lasts for 20 years, the people who are making decisions at the beginning of that project, they don't see the implications of their decisions that, that pop up at the end, which really impedes our ability to learn. It, it reduces accountability. Uh, it, it just, it, and it, it in, uh, reduces our, our talent development, you know, because really to, to get good at something, you need to be able to see the end of the story. You need to be able to make a decision and understand the implications of that decision. And if we if we miss that, then we miss the opportunity to to learn and develop and grow. So short schedules, tight budgets, small teams, these foster learning, accountability, um, and, and and program stability. They present a smaller target to the forces of change. You know, over a, a small time frame, there's fewer changes in the in the environment, in the in the competitive environment, in the technology environment, in the leadership environment, and the financial environment. And so you can you get more stability by having a shorter schedule, uh, and uh, yeah, so it just it keeps things more more human. Uh, the other thing I point out a lot is that innovation is a team sport. Innovation is is not just a, a one um, you know one person sitting in a garage. It really is a team sport, and diversity makes our teams better. And so connecting with people who have different experiences than I do, different backgrounds, different perspectives, different trainings. I love it when I'm part of a, a multidisciplinary team, uh, as I am on, on several of my projects at, at work these days. Um, and so complexity tends to get in the way of connection. Simplicity helps foster connection. Uh, you really get to know your team members when you're part of a small team. A, a big team, it, it's harder to really connect with the, with the other folks on the team. Uh, so a little bit ironically, one of the best ways to have the most talent is to have uh, not too much of it. So <laughs> too large of a team tends to foster um, social loafing and, and people just don't contribute because, hey, I'm part of a cast of thousands. If I don't do it, somebody else will. Uh, but if I'm a cast of five, if I don't do it, uh, not only will nobody else do it, but it'll be very apparent that I didn't do my part. Uh, so uh, again, the, this helps uh, draw out uh, more talent, gives people the ability to contribute. Uh, and again, you just you connect with your team better when it's a, a smaller team. So um, Which is just an example of restraint. Restrain yourselves on the number of people you load into. Absolutely, this. absolutely. And so that's that's one thing that drives me crazy a little bit. When people talk about, oh, Dan, so your 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 fire concept is fine, but does it scale? Does it scale? Well, I'm saying small teams are good, and you want to scale it up to a big team. Is that what you're asking? Uh, <laughs> so in a sense, in that sense, no. Uh, we don't want to scale this up to really big teams. Having said that, the Virginia class submarine program, a two billion dollar. Uh, nuclear powered submarine and they they built like a dozen of them so far and they're continuing to build them. That's a big team. So Let so it does that. right. <laughs> it does scale to that extent. Uh, but really the question when people ask does it scale, I think the real question is, does the impact scale? Can you do big strategic things with this method? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. Uh, and I contend that the the tactical ability to quickly deliver valuable solutions is itself a strategic capability. Uh, it is dependable, but not predictable. So it's, it's a reliable method for delivering advanced new stuff. I can't always predict how it's going to work out. I can't predict the, all the outcomes, but I can say this is a dependable, reliable uh, approach for, for delivering value, strategic value. Uh, and the trick here, of course, is to design these things with the future in mind, design these things with, with change in mind, 
Um, so the future is going to be surprising, but the fact that the future is surprising should not be surprising, right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, so does it scale? Not in the sense of, of you know, infinitely bigger teams, but does it scale in the sense of scaling up to strategic impact? Absolutely. You, you can really do big strategic impact with this, uh, but you do it in incremental, you know, a one, one uh, targeted tactical engagement at a time. Um, the other thing you mentioned in the book, you, you cite some research from Paul Zak on, on trust, which, uh, which, I, mm. which I liked, I hadn't come across before. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Oh my God. We're keeping on to the, the human theme. Um, trust is really kind of the, the secret sauce for making teams effective, isn't it? Um, the research that, that I quoted, if I, if I recall how it went, uh, he basically showed that uh, trust, people who are trusted tend to behave in a trustworthy manner. So trust tends to be a self-fulfilling prophecy in, in the best sense of the term. Uh, and that when we trust people, that also sends a signal about how trustworthy we are. Um, so trust is a great simplifier uh, because the alternative to trust is oversight and control and, and dictating and, and watching and monitoring. Uh, and that all requires effort that requires complexity to make those things happen. So trust is a simplifier for our systems, for our organizations, uh, for our teams. and people tend to rise to the occasion. When we trust them, they tend to behave in a trustworthy manner. So it's not about trust but verify because trust but verify basically means don't trust. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's about trust as a signal that I am trustworthy because I trust you. You are trustworthy because I trust you. Uh, and that, that should be our, our first step. Um, and so this, um, some of this is rooted in, in game theory. Uh, if you're familiar with the, the prisoner's dilemma, um, so research into prisoner's dilemma, and I won't go into all the, the specifics of that. Um, you can Google, people can Google later if they're not familiar. Uh, but the idea is that we are playing an iterative version of the prisoner's dilemma. We're playing it over and over again. The optimal strategy in a prisoner's dilemma scenario, specifically the iterative prisoner's dilemma, is something called a mirroring strategy. So whatever the previous, whatever the other person did last time, that's what you should do next time. Okay, and so you know, the research shows that that's, this mirroring strategy is the best strategy. Um, because that's the best strategy, my proposed strategy is what I call the always trust strategy. So if the other person is going to mirror what I'm doing, whatever I do this time, they're going to mirror that next time. I will trust them. They trust me next time. And then we get that virtuous cycle of, of continued reinforcing trust. Um, it's possible you get burned that first time. And one of the options with the iterative prisoner's dilemma is to walk away, to say, hey, I'm, I'm not going to play this game with you anymore. Um, but we do often don't have to end up there because um, this, this trust thing really does create uh, some really powerful uh, virtuous cycles of, of collaboration and, uh, and getting stuff done. Yeah, and what I liked was you, you touched on the neuroscience there, right? That it increases, by trusting someone, it increases the oxytocin in their brain. And that yes. has the impact of them be becoming more trustworthy. I thought that was fascinating. Like, I always kind of got it, but it always felt like a little bit kind of, that's a nice thing to believe. But here was right, some right, hard, yeah. <laughs> hard, uh, hard science, right? Which, yes, and, and thank you for pulling that out. Yeah, this this isn't like just it, sort of a, a touchy it's feely. The engineer as well really appealed, right? Okay. It's yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's not hypothesis. Like this is genuinely based on on brain science. Uh, and again, as an engineer, as, as a military guy, um, you know, I'm not coming into this as just sort of a, oh, wouldn't this be nice if the world was this way? Um, no, this is about data. This is about how people actually work, how teams actually work, uh, and the the examples of humanity at our best? How do we get the most uh, impact and value, uh, most dependably and most reliably? Uh, and, and trust is really a, a phenomenal strategy. Right. But if I was to play the skeptic here, I might say, well, actually, if I want restraint, right, if I, if I, if I, if I really want restraint, then isn't it, isn't it better that I provide some oversight, right, and, and not trust these people and make sure they don't overspend and make sure they don't use too many resources? That sure, might be yeah, the yeah. counter argument here. What would be your response to that? Yeah, and if you have a cast of thousands spending decades and billions, then uh, you're going to need some formal structures to, you know, monitor and enforce all those things. But when we have a small team with a short schedule and a tight budget, uh, it's easier to trust them because you know them. You're more likely to be directly connected with them. Uh, it's easier to trust them because the consequences of failure are restrained. You know, hey, you're spending, if you're spending $100 on something, it's much easier for me to trust you to do that than if you're spending $100 million on it. Uh, I get more nervous if you're spending $100 million on to make sure that gets spent well. But hey, if it's a $10 program, uh, go do it. What you, go yeah. figure it out and, and learn, and, and it's fine. Um, so this FIRE concept, by restraining cost, schedule, team size, all that stuff, really helps foster 
trust. It makes it easier for for a trust to to happen, uh, and that, that's so important because uh, if our proposal for making change requires rewriting human nature, um, that's doomed to fail. Okay, so <laughs> human nature says we are more likely to trust the people that we have face to face contact with. We're more likely to trust the people that are side by side with us, or shoulder to shoulder. Um, it's much harder to trust the anonymous, faceless bureaucrat who we've, you know, we know they're part of the organization, they're part of the team, and they're going to review something someday. Never actually met them because they're on the other side of the world. You know, it's much harder to trust when we have a, a, a huge investment of time and money. Uh, it's much harder to trust if I'm going to trust a decision that somebody made five years ago on this project and like things have changed. I'm not sure I'm going to try. I'm going to second guess that. I'm going to review it. I'm going to, and then that just tends to drive uh, waste and delay and rework. Uh, and removing rework, removing waste, removing delay. Uh, I'm showing my, my lean roots here. Um, is is really a, it's a good thing to do. And one of the ways we do that: small teams, short schedules, tight budgets, uh, or to put it more succinctly, speed, thrift, and simplicity. These things all help contribute to trust. Right. Right. Okay. Um, so I think we've given people a good, a, kind of a good tour of, of the of the philosophy here. What, what do you? If people are listening to this and saying, "Okay, you know, I kind of get it," and what what are the common responses you give to people, uh, and I know this is always going to be context dependent, but okay. do you have any sort of takeaways for people who are who ask you, okay, Dan, how do I how do I make a start with this? What are the first things you suggest I start looking? At? Yeah, yeah. So uh, one of the metaphors I use a lot is uh, we should build droids, not Death Stars. Uh, so kind of a, a Star Wars uh, theme here. But what do you do if you're, you're coming into a project and it's a Death Star already? And it was a Death Star before you got assigned to it, and it'll be a Death Star long after you've, you've left. Big, expensive, complicated, over budget, you know, behind schedule, uh, all that stuff. Um, what I contend is that if we are making decisions, if, if whatever decisions you get to make, uh, those decisions tend to be oftentimes selecting between alternatives that are a little faster or a little slower. A decision that costs a little bit more or costs a little bit less, one's a little more complicated and a little bit less complicated. Uh, down to like how you make your PowerPoints, how you write your documents, whatever decisions you get to make. I encourage people to try to move in the direction of speed, thrift, and simplicity for the designs that you contribute to, for the decisions you get to make. Maybe you can't turn the Death Star into a droid. You can't turn this big, expensive, complicated thing into a small, you know, speedy, thrifty, simple thing. Uh, but the next briefing you give, the next PowerPoint presentation you give, the next paper you write, the next line of code you write, uh, for, for all of these things, we can generally move in the direction uh, of speed, thrift, and simplicity. And if we do, we tend to get better results. Uh, now, if you're not making any decisions, if you're not designing anything, if you're not doing anything, uh, you're probably not listening to this podcast. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, fair, fair enough. Okay. Good. Um, well, uh, so for people who want want the resources, there's there's the two there's the two books actually. I'll uh, I'll share them on the, on the screen now for people who who are are watching here. Um, so the first uh, is well, there's there's two here. So there's there's the simplicity cycle, which is on the screen here. A field guide to making things uh, better, not worse, and uh, Ooh, only eleven left in stock, so buy them now, right? <laughs> uh, and then, and then, fire here. How fast, inexpensive, inexpensive, restrained, and elegant methods ignite innovation. Um, so those are those are the books. Anywhere else you would send people? Uh, sure, you can stop by my website, uh, thedanward uh, dot com. So T H E Dan Ward, my name, D A N W A R D. Uh, dot coms. So there's uh, links to articles. I'm pretty active on Twitter, so uh, at the Dan Morg, uh, on Twitter as well. And one of my other projects at work is something called an innovation toolkit. Uh, we didn't talk about it today, that, uh, but people can go to the website uh, itk, so which stands for innovation toolkit. So itk.mitre.org. So m i t r e, uh, and that's a collection of I think 24 different tools, techniques, and methods um, that anybody can use for um, problem framing, problem solving, reducing complexity, uh, basically helping your team be more innovative and deliver innovative solutions. So a lot of these are drawn from you know, human-centered design methods. Uh, some of them are, are fairly well-known, like personas or journey maps. Uh, others are sort of custom tools that uh, my team and I put together. Um, but it's all available as a free resource. You don't even have to sign in or log in. You can just download for each of these tools uh, what it is, when do you use it, why do you use it, and how to use it. You know, step one, step two, we kind of walk you through. Uh, you can download some free templates uh, that you can print out and use with your teams. 
Uh, so that's another great resource people can check out. Uh, and again, available free. You don't even have to, we don't need your, we don't get your uh, email address or anything like that. Like just go to uh, itk.minor.org and, and check that out. And there's a blog too there where we uh, share facilitation tips or tool profiles. Like here's how we use this tool in this particular situation. Uh, or here's how we kind of help facilitate uh, group discussions. Oh, wow. And that's what just that, that's, Kind of funded by MITRE, that's their gift to society as it is. It is, it is. Yeah, so MITRE is a, a, a nonprofit corporation. We, uh, we operate in the public interest. Um, so, uh, you know, we developed these really initially for our own use, for the projects that we were working on and, and for some of our sponsors and customers. Uh, we put it up on a website just to make it as easy as possible for folks to get access to it. Um, and since anybody can get access to it, we, we just want to share the word and, and that, hey, this is out there and available to you for free. And, and there's a lot of other companies who have done, you know, innovation toolkits uh, similarly. Uh, ours is the best. <laughs> now, our, uh, there, there are a number of these innovation toolkits out there. So if you don't find what you're looking for in ours, um, you know, just find other other companies that have done something. So, right. But that, but that actually spins me off into a whole. Maybe that's for another show. But sure. um, it's sort of part of a pattern of people opening up. You're just opening up the toolkits, right? Have it here. You know, right. Open, right. It, it's it's part of a movement, isn't it? It is. It is. And this uh, idea of, you know, intellectual property management in the digital era is, is certainly a, a, an interesting topic. Uh, and a part of my contention is that the um, John Perry Barlow, uh, he was a lyricist for the Grateful Dead uh, and founder of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, he says that the value of an idea increases with familiarity. Uh, and that really resonates with me, that the value of an idea increases the more people are, are familiar with it and aware of it. So things like the simplicity cycle, um, which I initially self-published and you know and, and made available as a free download uh, before you know the book version that HarperCollins uh, printed or uh, published for me, um, I just was giving it away because I thought the simplicity cycle as a concept is more valuable if more people know about it, uh, and then I get to be the guy who coined that term, um, and then if they want more about it, they you know they can come talk to me. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're we're a big fan of, of uh, Creative Commons licenses and, and things like that ways to share. Uh, knowledge uh, and, and help make the world a better place. Mm. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, thanks again. It's been a extremely energizing conversation. Uh, um, and I got tons of insight from the books. You know, we touched on some of the themes here, but really invite my listeners to, to go, uh, go buy the books as well. Uh, some great stories. Cool. Well, I had such a great time chatting with you. So appreciate uh, the opportunity to come be part of your show. And uh, I hope uh, your listeners do enjoy the books and I would love to, to hear from, uh, from all of them. Okay. All right. Thanks, Dan. Have a, have a great day. All right. Thank you.